so Matt will be speaking to us in uh, a little while. So I'm going to do the Bible readings for, for Matt's message this morning. So take me, oh no, that's not it. Right. <laughs> Hebrews 2, 1, 4. Therefore we must pay greater attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first through the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard him, while God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. Now into Psalm 102. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet unborn may praise the Lord, that he looked down from his holy height from heaven. The Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set those who were doomed to die, so that the name of the Lord may be declared in Zion and his praise in Jerusalem. When peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord, he has broken my strength in, in mid-course. He has shortened my days. Oh my God, I say, do not take me away at the midpoint of my life, you whose years endure throughout all generations. Long ago you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you endure. They will all wear out like a garment. You change them like clothing, and they pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. The children of your servants shall live secure. Their offspring shall be established in your presence. Morning all. Uh, my name is Matt. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm one of the leaders here at MCC. And I'd just like to reiterate uh, Toddy's warm welcome. Um, it's really wonderful to have you with us this morning, particularly if you are a visitor or you're relatively new to us. Great to have you here. Um, I'm going to be talking on Hebrews. I'll be continuing our series, as Toddy also said. Uh, and this morning we'll be looking at the little passage, well, a chapter in a bit, from uh, 1, verse 5, through to 2.18, which is all of chapter 2. So if you do have your Bibles with you, which hopefully you do, uh, I'd, I'd be inviting you to open them up now. Uh, with me. So Hebrews chapter 1, we'll be starting there and we'll be working our way through it. Uh, but before we go any further, I'd like, I'd like you to think, to picture in your mind one of your favourite long-term artists or creators. So this could be a painter, could be a musician, could be a filmmaker, could be an author, could be a group. It has to be someone or some group who, uh, who have made stuff who, or who are still have been making stuff for a long time, for a long time. So ideally they'll have like an early period, a middle period and a late period or whatever. So a long-term artist, a favorite of yours. Um, I'm most familiar with music when it comes to the fine or not so fine arts. So I'm gonna go to music for my uh, examples and be warned this is highly, this is hardly high culture coming your way, okay? So when I go to music for my examples of like of long-term artists, I think of people like the Beatles, I think of Madonna, I think of Bruce Springsteen, I think of you too, and, and maybe, maybe even uh, Taylor Swift has been long enough, has been around long enough now to have like an early, middle and late period. Um, and of course, Bob Dylan, one of my favorites. Now, many people love early Bob Dylan. This, um, sorry, so maybe I can turn this on. Oh, it's on, early, early Bob Dylan. <laughs> So uh, this is like his acoustic-y, protest-y, finger-pointing stuff. So songs like Masters of War, Blowing in the Wind, The Times They Are a Changing, etc., etc. 
I really dig this uh, myself. Sure, it's like, it's, it's clever, it's certainly clever, but it's always struck me as being a little bit too preachy uh, and has very little sense of humor at all. It's just so kind of bleak and relentless. I like the early electric stuff, just about like, and that's hardly a surprise. That's a pretty big club if you kind of count yourself as a Dylan fan, that's hardly original. So I like that, but I really, really, really like his much later in life stuff his old man stuff from the mid 90s onwards. Gruff, living in the past, not even his past, but the past before his past, and not going quietly into that dark night. I love this stuff. And like hats off to anyone who can rock a bowler tie with that much confidence, you know? I hope, like one day they'll come back, is the hope. Um, so this is my Dylan, right? This is my Dylan. Now hopefully by now you've got some kind of equivalent in your head, in your mind. I like my late period Dylan. I really love my mid period U2. And I think I'm curious and maybe even open about recent Taylor Swift. But the risk is when it comes to any artist who you admire and whose work you follow, the risk is, is that if you ignore other parts of their catalog, so to speak, then you're not getting the full picture of who they are as artists. And you're not really having a full appreciation of what it is that they've done. If I want to have a deep and thorough appreciation of Clint Eastwood, for example, as an artist, as an actor, and as a director, I can't just stick with his classic spaghetti West, uh, westerns. If I really want to know more about Clint Eastwood, then I have to go and get more familiar with stuff like the Dirty Harry movies and that really strange one he did in the 80s where he had a, uh, an orangutan as a co-star. Remember that? I think it was Any Which Way But Loose, yeah. Um, and that's going to be initially a little bit uncomfortable for me. It's not going to be kind of easy listening or the equivalent. But if I solely rely on the same material or sources that I'm comfortable with and that I'm used to for understanding the person who I'm trying to appreciate, the artist or, or whoever, then the risk is my understanding, my appreciation of that artist, that group, that person, it becomes unnecessarily narrow and incomplete. Do you see what I mean? I can't just stick with the stuff that I'm familiar with and that I naturally favor. What does any of this have to do with the book of Hebrews? You may well be asking by now. Well, as Tim helpfully explained last week in his little take on, uh, sorry, in, in his take on um, the little passage one to four of chapter one, Hebrews is all about Jesus, the person of Christ. But it's all about Jesus in a different way, I'd suggest, than say, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They approach Jesus, the person of Jesus, from a different angle, if you like, from a slightly different but complementary perspective. And if you're anything like me, the regular, familiar, biblical staples that inform your understanding, my understanding of the person of Jesus, are going to be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're my steady diet, if you like. And this makes sense, like they're pretty accessible compared to other parts of the New Testament, let alone the Old Testament. They're easier to read and dive into because they still have like the form of some kind of historical biography, if you like. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. But if we want to really know and love and appreciate Jesus more, I'd suggest that we need to be regularly dipping into books like Hebrews as well that offer a different but complementary perspective. Does that make sense? We need a more thorough, well-orbed understanding. So that's why we're here this morning looking at the book of Hebrews. We don't want our understanding, our comprehension, our love of Jesus to be unnecessarily narrow and incomplete. So we're going to be looking at a slightly, um, probably more inaccessible and harder to understand book. And today we'll be looking at the remainder of chapter one. Again, so this is from verse five onwards of chapter one and all of chapter two. And here is our rough roadmap. This is the plan. So I want to do a very brief recap. I want to go over the prologue again, so verses 1 to 4 in chapter 1. And then we'll be looking at how Jesus was no, no, no angel, why Jesus is superior to anything else going. And then thirdly, we'll be looking at how Jesus was no stranger, why Jesus is humbler than anyone else going. And lastly, the fourth point, we'll be looking at how Jesus wants our attention. So that's where we're headed. Okay, so first point, the recap. If you were here last week, you'll remember that Tim did a great job unpacking the crucial first four verses, just four verses of the book to us. 
And that little section is, is pretty much regarded as, if you like, the prologue of the entire book. And it introduces, just again, in the brevity of four verses, some really important themes that are returned to and expanded on throughout the rest of Hebrews. So as a quick reminder, here we are. In verse 2, the author reminds us that there are two characters here, two actors. There is God, and there is his son in verse 2. So God and his son. And this son, amongst other things, is the heir of all things. All things are coming to him, a part of his inheritance as the heir. And the son is also the means via which God created the world, or worlds in some translation. We read that this son is the reflection of God's glory and the imprint of God. So he shows, he represents, he mirrors who God is and what God is like. And not only that, he sustains all things. And again, that's all things. That's all inclusive. That's the whole package, all things. He not only made our world and possibly others, but he now maintains them as well. He keeps them going. And this son figure made purification for sin, something that we'll touch on today and that will come up extensively throughout the rest of Hebrews. And after making purification for sins, is now seated at the right hand of the majesty that is God. And seated at the right hand means there that he's in a position of authority and kind of like rested, relaxed authority. So just to pause there for a second and note that again, if you're anything like me, this is a perspective of Jesus that we don't often pay much thought to. Again, the Gospels are largely concerned with his time on earth, not his role beforehand in creation or what occurred after his ascension, after he rose from the dead, ministered to people, witnessed to people, and then was taken up to heaven. But again, it's books like Hebrews and passages like this that will hopefully help, him, uh, help broaden our love and our understanding of Christ. So that's the first point. Now, the second point, Jesus was no angel. Now, in the NRSV version, one version, um, the, the version that I used to prepare this, angels, so that term angels, are mentioned no less than seven times in chapter one. And a comparison is clearly being made between Jesus on one hand and these heavenly messengers on the other. Now, let's remember that the likely audience for this book were, um, was, was Jewish. It was Jewish, likely. Not definite, but likely. And angels played an important part in Jewish religion. So they're all throughout the Old Testament. Now, it's important to note they weren't seen as being anywhere equal to God. They were his messengers. They were his servants. They did God's bidding. They were creatures, if you like. So they weren't, again, divine. They were creatures. But nevertheless, in the cosmic kind of pecking order, they seem to be above humankind. And when they confront or when they interact with humanity, they're often intimidating, they're powerful, they're awe-inspiring. And they act as, if you like, intermediates between God and humans, but always operating under God's authority, always doing God's bidding, not humans. And crucially, for our little passage here, angels were associated with the giving of the law from God to people. So top of Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments, the entire law, angels were associated with that process. They were part of that. And you can see that in passages in the New Testament, like Acts chapter 7, 38. So when God was commanding his chosen people, when he was kind of forming the nation of Israel and showing them how to live back in Exodus, so this is a big deal in the formation of the nation of Israel, angels were involved. So angels are really important. But this son figure who was introduced in the prologue is seen as far superior to the angels. And that's what the rest of chapter one points out. So look at verses uh, five and six, if you've got your Bibles there. We can look up on the screen here. This is the many ways that this son figure is superior to the angels. That title, son, is mentioned twice. Now, the son of God in the Jewish religion and history, it was a loaded term. It comes with a whole lot of baggage, if you like. It went beyond just a regular family relation and was associated with a promised herald Jewish anointed king, otherwise known as the Messiah or the Christ in Greek. And this, this chosen king was going to be a descendant of David, the kind of the ideal king or the closest thing to an ideal king in Jewish history. And this chosen king, the son of God, was going to faithfully obey God 
and perfectly follow that law that we talked about before. So son, in this regard, it means image, replica, representative, not just progeny, if that makes sense, not just, you know, um, not just a relation. It goes beyond that. But then in verse 6, something really startling happens. The angels, God's messengers and ambassadors, they're directed to worship this son. And we've got to remember, Judaism was a monotheistic religion. They worshipped one and only one God. They recognised one and only one God. And that God was the object of that worship. And suddenly, in this verse, in this quotation from the Old Testament, angels are called to worship the Son. So critically, what this is doing is equating this Son figure with God. This Son is also God. Further on, as you read along, and Dan, you'll see in verse 8, it should say something in your translation like this. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And later in verse 9, therefore, God, your God has anointed you. And it's really important at this point to work out who's doing the talking here and who's being talked to in these two verses, verse 8 and 9. And if you look at verse 8, at the start of it there, it says, but of the son, he says, duh, duh, duh. So who's the he? Who's doing the saying? It seems to be God, the Father. So in verse 8 and verse 9, we have God the Father addressing the Son figure as God. Does that make sense? Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. So God the Father is addressing the Son as God, as an equal. So again, we have in a monotheistic religion, a one God only religion, we now have two figures that are God. So again, we've got to stress this. This son figure is God. Not just anyone, not just an angel, but God. Further in verse 10, you'll see that this same son figure is also referred to as Lord. And Lord is a title that, as you're aware, carries authority and majesty. And we read there in verse 10 about some of the characteristics of this authority. So we've got the power to create things. In the beginning, you founded the earth. And we have these qualities of, uh, these qualities of permanency, of immortality. So in verse 11, we read, you remain, you are the same, your years will never end. And lastly, in this section, in verse 13, we read that God will take the enemies of this sun figure and make them a footstool for the sun's feet. I'm not suggesting this has to be or should be read literally, but it certainly suggests that the sun figure is destined for victory and dominance over all his enemies. So let's put all this together so far. The son is the promised and expected divinely appointed king of Israel, the Messiah, but also God who is to be worshipped and Lord who is all powerful. This son, who is Jesus, is, a completely, is in a completely different class to the angels. The angels who are powerful, important, and associated with the giving of the law. Again, the event that crystallized the nation of Israel. So if the angels were intermediaries between God and humanity, Jesus is God. That's what this passage is saying. Not just kind of a go-between, if you like, or a messenger boy, but God. And if what the angels revealed to God's people was amazing, particularly on the top of Mount Sinai with the giving of the law and the, and the Ten Commandments, how much more amazing is the Son's revelation and message going to be? So just a couple of quick things here on this point. These claims about the Son that are being made haven't come out of nowhere. It's not like the author, whoever they were, pulled them from their imagination or even recent sources. Here in the first chapter of Hebrews, we've got seven references from the Old Testament that help make these claims. Seven references, starting with Psalm 2 and verse 5 and finishing with Psalm 110 and verse 13, which is, why, um, which is why we read out a psalm before, one of these psalms. And these two psalms, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, they're known as coronation psalms. They were probably sung when new kings came to power in the nation of Israel. We also have an excerpt from Psalm 45. We have some stuff from 2 Samuel and also Deuteronomy. So again, like there's a pedigree to this. There's a history. 
there's been this long-held expectation, a wanting for this Messiah, this King, this long-promised Jewish King from the line of David who will lead God's people with God's authority. For hundreds of years, this has been like lurking. And now this son, Jesus, is fulfilling this. And this first chapter of Hebrews is giving us, if you like, a, a sneak peek at his enthronement, the victory ceremony that took place after he ascended to heaven, after his earthly ministry. So again, it's important to note these claims are steeped in history, in the Jewish religion and tradition. They aren't some harebrained, completely left field, original and novel idea, you know, from someone who's incredibly creative. It's different from that. And if you get the chance, I'd encourage you this week, go back over Hebrews 1 and read those Psalms at length, because they will give you a so much more richer, you know, deeper understanding and appreciation of the figure of Christ. Check that out. Also, just, just think about what this passage so far is saying about how to live. It's a, such a, it's such a, like, maybe, you know, maybe we're too used to it. We got, we're, we're almost kind of um, dulled to its impact because we're so familiar with it. But this claim is amazing. This passage is making the claim that the Son, the creator and sustainer of the world, the immortal, the lasting, the all-powerful whom angels worship, this God came to earth and walked amongst us as a man. And this God-man has given us a revelation. He's revealed to people how to live, how to flourish, how to live a wise, good life. Now, if this is true, if this is true, where else would you turn to for your revelations on how to live, for your direction on how to live like a good life? Why would you rely on anything else like philosophy, sociology, psychology, self-help, empty religion, tradition, hedonism, gurus, YouTube influencers, or just doing what most people around you are doing? Why would you rely on those things to guide how you live? I'm not saying that there's no wisdom in any of those things. Far from it. But I'm talking about the ultimate and final revelation of the purpose of life and how to live it. Where else would you go besides this figure? So that's point two. Point three. Now we're moving on to chapter two, verses five to 18. Jesus was no stranger. So like, there's a bit of a turn here in the, in the argument, if you like. The author starts quoting from another bit of the Old Testament, Psalm 8 and reminds his readers of the kind of ultimate destiny and privilege that humans have been designed for. We were originally designed to be stewards, caretakers of everything. That is, we were meant to be looking after all creation. It was meant to be under our care and our authority, our delegated authority from God. I mean, that's a big call. Like, are humans really all that? But if you're familiar with the Christian or Jewish story, you'll recall that it's all there in chapter one of Genesis. This was our original mandate for humanity, to be vice regents of God's, to be good stewards of his creation. Again, if you're aware of the story, that didn't even last a full two chapters in the book of Genesis. We didn't even make two chapters there. Things derailed significantly. Death, at least for humanity, first entered the scene. And we were alienated from God, from each other, our fellow humans, and from, of all, and from all creation. We'd fallen from such a great height. But we read now in chapter two, instead of just leaving us where we fell, or even like distancing himself from us, look what God does. We read that in verse nine, Jesus, again, the son figure of chapter one, was made lower than the angels. So remember, this is the heir of all things, the creator and sustainer of the world, is made lower than the angels for a while. And not only that, but in verse nine, he suffered and tasted death. So the creator of life voluntarily experiences the opposite of life, death. Why? Why? It says there in verse nine, for everyone. He tasted death, he experienced death fully for the sake of everyone. What did this achieve? Well, numerous really good things. We read on. In verses 10 to 13, people have been returned to God's family. So we are once again God's children. We can call God father and we're called brothers and sisters of Jesus and we share in his inheritance. Those broken relationships are now restored. In verse 14 and 15, 
and this is particularly pertinent this morning, the power of death has been destroyed. The power of death has been destroyed. That is, death can no longer alienate us from God, nor permanently alienate us from each other. That's no small thing. And really knowing that, believing that, having that conviction about death's power being kind of rendered impotent, it will rob us of that terrible fear and control that the idea, the thought, the predicament of death can have over people. As the writer refers to it in verse 15, this fear of death, it's a kind of slavery. It's a kind of slavery. It's a horrid thing to live under, that just perpetual fear of death. And in verse 15, we also read about Jesus tasting death. He's tasting it. He's experiencing it. He's going through it. Destroy the devil. So Jesus has the victory over the devil. Not that it was ever a contest between equals, but this is a good and encouraging thing for us to be reminded of. The devil has been unmanned. That's what's happened there. So hopefully you can start to see the many things achieved by Jesus stooping down and making the sacrifice. But it's worth pointing out what this took. In verse 14, 17, and 18, it makes it pretty clear that in order to save us, in order to give us all those benefits, Jesus had to become one of us. That is flesh and blood in every respect, tested so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest. Now in the Jewish uh, religion, the high priest played this special mediating role between the people of God and God. So it was the high priest who would make sacrifices on behalf of the Jewish people to God in order to show the contrition, if you like, of the people, to demonstrate their contrition to God for the wrongdoing that they had done him. And the high priest was human, was always human. So to play this role, God had to become also human. And it doesn't seem to be too much of a stretch to say that God now knows what it is like to be human. And maybe even more amazingly, God knew what humans could be like towards him and each other. And yet he still became also human and suffered the fate that we were meant to in our place. Now that's merciful. That, and it's not just merciful. I mean, just being merciful is no small thing, but that's also apex humbleness. I don't see how it gets any more humble than that. So there you have chapter one. In chapter one, Jesus the Son being superior to anything or person and being divine in nature. So that's the first part. And then in chapter two, the complement to this, Jesus the Son being more humble than anyone and consenting to being human in nature at the same time, divine and human. Superior and humble, side by side, coexisting. Now we have the last section of this talk, and this is going to take a quick back step to the start of chapter 2, so verses 1 to 4. This, this little passage in chapter 2 is the first of five in the book that are often called the warning passages, and they're interspersed throughout the teaching that the author is giving over the entire thing. And in this first example of a warning passage, the message well, the warning is quite clear. We must pay greater attention and not drift from the message we've heard from Jesus. So just a couple of points on this to conclude. Throughout these first couple of chapters, the author is reminding us constantly of the importance and the power of God speaking. He keeps on bringing our attention back to God's words. God declares things, and those declarations have the power to actually create and shape reality. And this is a big deal. This is a big deal because while there's always going to be some mystery tied up with God, he's, there's always going to be an otherness to him because he is, he's other compared to us. At the same time, he's also reaching down to us. He self-discloses. He reveals himself and truth to us. Not everything, not by a long stretch, but enough. So this is right there at the very start of Hebrews. In verse 1, you'll remember, it says, God spoke to our ancestors. In verse 3, he sustains things through his powerful word. And in chapter 2, the warning, we have to pay attention to what we have heard. And in verse 2, we're reminded of the message, the law, that was again declared. It was spoken by God's angels. 
And in verse 3, we read that salvation was declared by the Lord, by Jesus, that is, and heard by people, declared and heard. These are words. So remember that we spoke before of Jesus being a revelation. He reveals truth and reality to us. And the warning here isn't so much that we don't understand that spoken truth and reality. It's not a matter of not understanding it, but that we neglect or we forget it. That's the warning. That's the risk. So look at that first verse in chapter two again. Pay greater attention so that we don't drift away from it. So again, this isn't so much about learning new truths as much as don't forget the ones that have already been established. You can't drift away from something unless you were right there next to it in the first place, right? And the Greek term that is translated drift in many of our Bibles, it has nautical themes, a nautical theme. It's like a, it's, it's kind of not drifting can be thought of as dropping anchor in a port so that you don't go anywhere. You remain stable and close to the thing that, you, that is supposed to give you shelter. That's what we're not meant to drift from. And isn't it interesting that the remedy here for drifting is pay greater attention. Attention. Just so hard to keep in our world. And our world is just so easy to be distracted in and by. And as a result, it's just so, so easy to find ourselves drifting. You'll see there in verse 2 of, of uh, chapter 2, it refers to the message delivered by the angels. And this, this probably is referring to, again, like the giving of the Ten Commandments and the Jewish law via Moses on Mount Sinai back in Exodus. And do you remember how the people drifted at that time back in Exodus? In, uh, in chapter 32, of Exodus, it tells a story how Moses is up the mountain with the angels and God receiving the Jewish law, the revelation, and the people and um, Aaron back below the mountain, beneath the mountain on the plains. We read in, in Exodus chapter 32 of how they still believed in the divine. They had a belief in a divine power. They knew firsthand that they'd been miraculously del- saved and delivered from slavery in Egypt. They were fully aware of that. They didn't doubt that. And they still wanted to worship the God who was responsible for that salvation. But they drifted from that God, the unseen God that didn't want any image to be made of him. And instead, they created their own, a golden calf. And they said to that human-made idol, this is the God who brought us out of Egypt. So they didn't turn their back on God entirely. They drifted. They compromised. They sold out if you like. That was their sin. And that seems crazy to us, but we suffer the same risk, don't we? The warning that we find here at the start of chapter 2 in Hebrews is for Christians, for, for followers of Jesus. How are we likely to drift from what we've heard? What's likely to steal our attention? Will it be the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth, as Jesus taught in the parable of the sower? Will it be the the possible social stigma and cost of belonging to an increasingly minority group in society? Or will it be the lack of time that most of us experience and the subsequent lack of time for spiritual disciplines, companionship and spiritual community? I'd probably put my money on the last one myself, a lack of time. To pay attention to something requires time. It can't be I suppose it can't be fast forwarded. Being reminded about truths, having them kind of be baked into you, if you like, so they become convictions, so they become part of your second nature, so they become part of your regular day-to-day operating system. This takes place over the course of days, weeks, months. As someone uh, once said, I can't remember who, you can't love anything at speed. You can't love anything at speed. And I'd say that includes Jesus. To love, to pay attention, it requires time. Time that we increasingly don't seem to have in our modern world. So let me close with this. The Bible Project guys point out that this warning isn't to scare us so much as it is to stop us in our tracks, to make us pause and reassess. In chapter 1, we're reminded of Jesus' superiority and his greatness. In chapter 2, of his humility, his love, and his sacrifice for us. 
And again, if we really believe that these are true and we put them together, then why would we possibly give our attention to any other big competing message? Why would we accept any second-rate substitute truths? Why well, do you see what I mean? What else, who else is there in your life? Who else is so powerful, so enduring, so permanent, but who also knows you so well, your depths, your foibles, your struggles? Again, who knows you so well, but who loves you so much regardless? Why chase any other truths other than that one? The more familiar we are with the full depth and width of who Jesus is and what he's done, again, superior and humble, the more that we can appreciate and understand all the facets of that, the more likely, I believe, we'll be able to maintain our focus on and our devotion towards him. And that's our prayer. So let's pray now. Father, um, I, I just pray that you help all of us remain devoted to you. Help us fix our attention and our focus on you, Father. Help us, as Alistair said before, help us be able to uh, enjoy your good creation. Help us be able to steward that well. But I pray that it will never preoccupy us or distract us to the point where we lose sight of you, Father. And I want to thank you for your son. Uh, again, thank you for his superiority, for his greatness for the fact that on one level he's just so other to us, but also that he was willing to stoop down and humble himself out of love for you and for his creation, Father. I pray that um, through his spirit, we will over time and the help of each other and your word just become more and more like him in our respective callings and our respective specific context, Father. Help us over time become the individuals and the people that you'd have us be father and again um, I thank you for your for your um, for your scriptures I thank you that although so much of this is referencing events that took place thousands of years ago now it still has real world relevance and direction and guidance for us in our often confusing and harried and busy modern times Amen